In the Shoreline Program, outright prohibition throughout the jurisdiction is a sweeping statement and it has to be consistent with state law. And that's, that's our data. Sure, so if our, if in looking at the CUPs that we, if we went that route, and uh, looking at our CUPs, um, you or, or your associates would say, well, gosh, looking at the CUPs here, uh, it appears that this seems like an outright prohibition. They're not using that language. Uh, would, would, would we run into that kind of barrier if we were able to explain that these CUPs had, were rational and, uh, and we only were allowing net pens in certain, within certain reaches? Okay. 
okay, and, and everything else is you know, as attentive like the dam or whatever. Uh, you know, John mentioned the uh, mill site. Uh, look at that. And actually, there was one there that didn't work uh, years ago. Um, so yeah, we, we've looked at each one of those. Most of those uh, high intensity uses, though, are the little bitty marina sites. And, uh, they didn't really work. And I think that's part of the problem with I don't think that is necessarily correspond to what's going on on land. You know, they're out there, so probably. So, you know, that really, there's a real disconnect between the shoreline and way out in the water. Maybe the shoreline uh, management program ought to be everything within uh, so many thousand feet of the shore. And then after that, no. But that's not the way it is for us. It's out to the boundary line. You know, we didn't zone the water, and I, I guess nobody really has. And uh, we're talking about that now all the way up the coast, you know, zoning the ocean, zoning, and finding places that they can't put uh, electrical facilities, for example, going, it looks empty out there. Well, no, people are using it for stuff. Well, if I can put the solutions, I guess. Well, I guess, and then I should have the question is focused at this point, but I think that it's Again, I would just offer that we would be happy to sit down and work with your staff to look again at the array of, of information that you have and see if we can, you know, together try to, to reassess that question of use and compatibility and appropriate you know, locations and environmental conditions. Um, because I, I think you're right. As they are out of the water, but I'm not sure it didn't sound like that's what you've been focusing on. It was, or uh, high intensity areas. So I'm not sure I understand the reasoning around that. And so that would be that would be the helpful part of us sitting down and going over this stuff with the staff. And so the team together to come up with an uh, approach. Um, in in Mongolia experience, it was very helpful to have the industry of the in terms of helping us understand where the opportunities lie for them. You know, in terms of that your question of where it is a good location. You know, and um, in terms of the really I think that uh, we change the technology it's a little hard to say exactly where they might want to be because technology, you know, and they don't really know until they're there where it'll be successful or not. But it may be helpful to have your own conversations with them before you to try and get a sense uh, where are opportunities in the lot. And again, um, it's hard from a proprietor you know, uh, perspective to have to offer that up, but um, I, I just want to suggest that as an option. We were able to have some conversations that were at least helpful in understanding you know, what was is considered suitable. Uh, the other person in the group was Stephen at the University of Washington could bring in some expertise, scientific expertise from all of them. They do this kind of stuff. <laughs> So you don't want to ask you're going to have to do something to do with that. Okay. Well, all right. So, I'm going to ask you to do that. 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 I'm going to ask you to do that.
was thought that uh, the ocean could handle the carbon dioxide and the tree and the earth. And now we have an ocean of a city water. So that, that's my concern. If, if, if this many chemicals is going in, and we expect that it's going to cover the revolution, at what point do we reach a point where it gets not in the balance? I can touch on some of that in that the permits that we have issued right now require chemical monitoring and reporting for all chemicals. And a lot of the reports that I have read in science magazines and journals refer globally to the methane industry. And a lot of it is Chile, um, primarily Chile, Norway, and the chemicals that they use. And, and I have found to my inspections and looking at the reports that come in from our industry in this state, is they do not use those chemicals. They're not found in their product, in their feed, in, in how they do their operations. We have nine methods in this state versus you know, hundreds in other places that are packed in and high density. <coughs> so that's something you know, we're, we try to address those concerns in the, pollutant, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System yeah. permit that we issue to each facility. Well, the requirements. You brought up another concern of mine, and that is the nine net that are in the at this point. But the, the emphasis is coming down from the Department of Commerce because we have an $8.7 million trade deficit in, uh, in uh, seafood. It seems to me we're not looking at the potential of nine net and we're kind of looking at dividing the Puget Sound into kind of reminds me of a um, it's, it's like dividing it into, like the land rush of Oklahoma. I, I mean, right now, off the shores of Hawaii, they're in huge net beds, they're raising tuna fish. Um, and that's my concern here, is not the nine net beds that we have, not even the potential of 15. It's when we try to balance the trade deficit, and we're talking about a substantial number. I can address some of those chemical issues because we actively work on that as well as kind of some of the other things we brought up. Um, first of all, the dye that you mentioned is actually um, their crop of pigments, which are used in that dye. They're exactly the same compounds as our wild fish, acetanthin, cantexanthin, and chemical names. And they're the same type of crop as you find carrots, and carrots, orange, or marigolds, yellow. It's a broad class of, of compounds and all sorts of, of, of things. So they're entirely natural. The environment handles those just as they would a, a shrimp or a dime or, or anything else. The other com compounds, most of the classes you list were, are, are dioxin-like or PCB-like compounds. Those came from largely from industrial pollution that happened years and years and years ago, um, use of transformers. They're out in the environment. They're getting transferred up through the food chain and come back to um, salmon in, in the fish oil that's used in the diet. Right now, fish oil is becoming less and less uh, a part of the diet. Those levels are, are greatly diminished and not way below any health organization's um, concern area. Um, and in addition, when, when that the one famous uh, paper that came out, the Heist Report came out, um, Company started filtering oil to remove uh, dioxin like compounds and PCBs. And in fact, if you look at the Department of Health, Washington Department of Health levels, um, Pete the Sound Chinook are way higher than the farm fish are. Um, so I think a lot of that, those those chemical compounds have been are old issues or non issues. Uh, we also mentioned antibiotics. There's, there's only two approved in the United States. And talking in our own lab, um, the only time we see antibiotics is when we're in wild fish and under a lot of stress. We've never had to use them from uh, fish coming from from hatchery that are domesticated. And when we're talking with people around, that's kind of a general, um, a, a general statement. Now I don't have access to the records on antibiotic feed in the U.S., but. It all has to be prescribed by a veterinarian for a case-by-case -case basis due to a bonus. They're not fed for growth enhancement like they are for cattle and chicken. They just don't work that way. Um, there's no advantage and they're expensive. Um, there's some other... I, 
sometimes they were used because the fish are so tightly. Now those again, with, with, that with salmon, those are from uh, uh, pretty much entirely been replaced by vaccination. They are still used in in countries like um, where they have a lot of different species, and that there's not been a scientific effort put into vaccination. Um, and so you do see that coming in fish from China, fish from India, and so on and so forth. So there is still antibiotic use out there, but uh, if you look at the main salmon industry, you look at Washington salmon industry, that's a thing of the past. 